Welcome uh, to uh, Cinefest 22. I had to think what year it was now. Cinefest 22, uh, another symposium panel a discussion, and they've been going fantastic so far. Uh, those of you who saw the last one realize how important these can be. The discussion today is uh, short films, your calling card to the industry. Uh, and I have uh, with me uh, several filmmakers uh, of repute, and uh, starting with two, my immediate left, Carl Schmallenberg? Schmallenberg? Schmallenberg. Schmallenberg. I'm going to call you Kyle from this point on. Uh, and to, well, a little briefly about Kyle, he is a, an award winning director, writer, and producer uh, at Wrapped Productions, which I believe is a production a company you share with your, your wife as well. And uh, your previous work spans commercial, branded content, uh, documentaries, uh, comedy series, and the list goes on. But I think the important thing about what you're doing is that you often tell stories from lesser heard perspectives, uh, which was uh, the focus of the conversation prior to this one. To uh, Kyle's left is uh, somebody who I've enjoyed watching uh, a lot on television, particularly Netflix, Paula Brincati. Uh, she has this great short film that premiered here at the festival called Junior's Giant. We'll be able to talk to Paula about that a little more. Uh, to Paula's left is Katie Bolin, I'm sure not a stranger to most people in the room. Uh, Katie is a multiple award-winning director, screenwriter, actress, and author. I did not know you were an author. I learned that at our last panel. <laughs> uh, she had a short film, uh, Lulzita? Lulzita? Perfect. Uh, yeah, oh, perfect. Well, obviously a, a work on Lolita. Yes. Uh, and so we look forward to chatting to you about that. It's almost, you almost don't need an introduction, award-winning actor. Uh, m I don't know how many films you have in your, your repertoire, but I do know that you've worked with some amazing, amazing director. Paul Thomas Anderson, I believe, you worked with? Yes, very briefly, but yes. <laughs> I don't know if you can be brief with Paul Thomas <laughs> Anderson. I think working with him is, would be spectacular, regardless of the minutes involved. And then at the very end of the row is uh, Mr. Steve Belford. He's an accomplished actor as well. And uh, Ontario Green Screen Ambassador and worked extensively in film and television for the past 20 years. Um, welcome to everybody on the panel. Thank you. Now, please go ahead, let them feel welcome. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, the title of this, uh, this symposium, Short Films, Your Calling Card to the Industry. I, too, got into the business uh, by making a short film, which was lucky enough to get into Sundance and sort of paved my way from that point on. But making that short film, everyone said, when you make a short film, it is not a calling card. It is a film. So the, I wonder about this title of the symposium and how you feel about that. And I'll start with you, Kyle. Everybody's entitled to their own perspective, uh, but I think, I think a short film, just like a feature film, can be a number of things, depending on, on what you're hoping to get out of it, right? I mean, certainly a short film is a film. It tells a story from the beginning until the end. Um, sometimes there's a dual purpose for that, which is also to try and establish themes or characters or explore something deeper for a, a project that comes afterwards. Um, is that like a cop-out answer? <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm actually glad that you answered that way because uh, I definitely, when I made my short film, I went, oh no, it's a full story. I went, it's my calling card. Uh, so I'm with you on that. Paula, you can agree or disagree. You know, I think it, I think it can be both. I, I, something that I love about shorts is that it, it is it can really focus on a moment in time, and it's such a specific art form. I love watching shorts programs because it, it it really is a different skill set. I produced my first short so many years ago, and this that I just directed, Junior's Giant, that was here, was my first time making a short in many years, and I felt like I had to resharpen those tools because you have to be very exact, and you only have so much time to really tell the story. So I think. As an art piece, it's its own thing. And then, you know, certainly when you're cutting your teeth as a director, I think that's me feeling like, okay, I'm going to start here and maybe I can grow to a feature next. So, uh, not to cop out either, but I think it can be both. <laughs> Katie, are you going to cop out? 
No. All right. I didn't <laughs> expect that from you. No, I think everything that, that has been beautifully said so far, I would say the way that I look at shorts and what I would tell other creators, particularly actors who are making their first short, is you're spending the money anyway, so it better serve a lot of purposes. So... You know, no one's making a short completely for free. I'm lucky in that I've gotten government funding to make my shorts. Steve is a filmmaker who has self-financed, so he's excited to talk about that model as well. But I think if it doesn't serve multiple purposes, then I don't think you should be making it. That's a very interesting answer. I, and I'll just ask one question. Uh, yeah. Is that not true of all films? I mean, particularly, I think, from my POV is a... Uh, filmmaker, I so far have put myself in everything that I've made, so <laughs> it sometimes, better be a calling sometimes card. Sometimes twice. <laughs> yeah, Some, sometimes twice. Um, but yes, I think um, yeah, of course, all film and, and no film is, very few films are inexpensive to make, right? So if you're thinking about it as a business, I think it, it makes sense to be pragmatic in that way and be like I can use it as a calling card for this skill set and I also hope it has this life at a film festival and I hope I can sell it to this distributor. Excellent. Uh, Steve, self-financing, that sounds scary, but first, an the, the calling card or not a calling card? Yeah, everyone's always, you've all answered the, the questions already, but yeah, I mean, I've done films that it wasn't supposed to be anything bigger than that. It was a three minute, um, it was just to get your feet wet, the, that kind of thing, experience, but yeah, I think if there is, it has to be a standalone, just like any film that you're like, uh, like a feature film, where you're like, well, there's a sequel and there's a third one, but they have to be standalone films and, and because you may not get to that one. So it has to be that. And same with a, a short film. Um, it has to be live on its own, but also it can expand. I think Saw was a short film and it was just one scene and, and that's a franchise now, right? So, but it started with a, that idea and they expanded from there. Yeah, and those filmmakers were 18 when they made that film. And now look at them, they're making Fast and Furious movies too. Um, with the soft films, I think it should have stayed a short film. But anyway, um, <coughs> you know, we're going to get into financing because I do, th I do think that's an important topic. Uh, and there's, as Katie pointed out, uh, that there is financing in place, uh, government financing. Uh, but then there's uh, self-financing, which, as I said, sounds scary as heck. Um, so talk about financing your films. And again, it's very easy just to go down the line if we do this. And I see Kyle. Uh, so, so for the recent short film that I did, which is in the festival called Braided Together, we financed that primarily with leftover development money uh, that we were using or that we got for, for writing the feature film script, um, which mm -hmm. is kind of a super privileged position to be to have leftover development I money. I have you never know. heard of that right. before. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I suppose I don't because... I have leftover <laughs> lunch money. Okay, go ahead. We got, we got a couple of sources of funding for the feature, but didn't need it all. So we, we put some aside, you know, thinking that, okay, maybe, maybe this will be useful down the line if we continue to develop, if the development phase is very long, you know, or maybe it could be used for, for something else. But we didn't have, at that point, a short film in mind, right? It was only because we had some funds, we were like, oh, we, we could do something with this, so we might as well, right? Um, but just on that point of funding and payment, I think that it's also, as people do in short films, they're smaller scale most of the time, and you're really passionate about this idea, right, for this, for this short little story you want to get out into the world, and your inclination is to ask for free help, get a lot of favors, not pay yourself, and I don't think that I like that approach. It, you must have an incredible finance person <laughs> in place to yeah. have <laughs> leftover money. And, and be paying yourself and people. Well, I think you yeah. skipped paying yourself, right? Or did you? No, I did. Oh my I God. Did. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm going to the <laughs> bank of <laughs> Kyle from this point on. That's fascinating. That's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Oh, you did it? You <laughs> Congrats. Yeah, this is the, yeah, the producer. Amazing. <laughs> I'm going to go to you, Paula. Uh, how much money did you have left over from your... <laughs> That's for me and the Scotiabank to, to look at. But, um, <laughs> but, 
you know, it's been, I've been, it, there's a few different models. The first short I did was self-finance with myself and my producing partner for that short, Mike Cedar. And we called in a lot of favors and we were really scrappy and we, I don't think we even understood what insurance was. Like, you know, we really were learning like on the fly. So I would say it was worth a lot more. It cost very little because we did, we, we were really lucky to be at our first time out calling favors on people who we'd been on set with as child actors for years. So I think that's something that is, is incredibly, an incredibly privileged position to be in. And, uh, you know, after that, I was lucky enough to produce with Bravo Fact. So that's a different, you know, funding source that I think you've worked with as well that's no longer around, unfortunately. We're very lucky to have had that. That, that allowed for a much bigger budget really paying people day rate, full day rates, taking a producer fee, you know, something that I was unfamiliar with at the time. And, uh, and, and most recently with uh, my directorial debut, um, that was privately financed. And, you know, it was sort of like, it, it was an, an, a nice size budget, I felt, because I didn't have to be so scrappy, but you're still being creative. I think even when a budget, there's never enough money is, is sort of what I feel. So that is, is my take. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I sort of like the, cr the, the creativity and no matter where the money's come from, you feel a responsibility to, to however you've gotten it to make sure you're not wasting anybody's time, to make sure you're putting out a good product, and to make sure you're creating a really um, safe and fun and collaborative working environment. So that's important to me no matter what the size of, of the budget is. Wow. I will say too, when I made my short film, I was lucky enough that the, the DOP of Alien, the first movie, was my boss and filmed it for me. We had half a million, yeah. Wow. It was amazing, and it was a terrible movie, but it looked great. <laughs> it's great for a reel, you can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Katie. Um, so I've actually made two short films, one that I talk about called Lolzita uh, that you mentioned, and that was funded by Bravo Fact, um, which was an amazing fund that we had in Canada. And if I had not had that if I did not get that money, I would not have a career as a director and I would not have a career as a writer. And it is a real tragedy that that fund no longer exists because filmmakers are often not allowed to go from an idea to a feature film. You have to prove normally to get funding that you can direct and you have directed something. So I was very sad when that fund closed. And I am proud of that short. I made a second short film that was funded by the Harold Greenberg Fund, which is another fund in Canada that, that no longer exists. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that was a presentation, it's called Twins, and it was a presentation short for my feature. It was a proof of concept. It did not do enough things, which, was, which is my problem with it. And I also I made some mistakes that then I didn't make when making the feature. Um, but I would say to any filmmakers listening, if, especially if you want to do something a little bit daring as a first-time filmmaker, you should make a proof of concept short, even if you have to just shoot it on your iPhone. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I'll say about twins, yeah. Is, is proof of concept, is that sort of a rejigged uh, um, a call, term for calling card? It sounds better than calling card. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a proof of the concept of your feature. So I had to prove that I could direct myself as twins. And you did, and you did wonderfully. But Thanks. you haven't seen, if you haven't seen Katie's feature film, which premiered here, please do. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. As you said, it's a wild ride. <laughs> um, when it comes to funding, I just wanted to make films. And the stories that we were telling, we didn't have a lot of people that we needed um, to make it. Like, we even, like, do we need makeup? N no, we don't need makeup. So we just, so the actress, she's like, well, I have some theater makeup. Okay, done. And we just used that, what she had. She had to have a black eye, so she just did her own makeup. Um, we took away a lot of the things that normally you would have on a set. And uh, that film was really successful. Uh, we, we turned a profit at that, it made its budget back. Um, and that film was shot on this little camera. <laughs> this little handy cam. On a coffee mug. And that, that got uh, distribution. Wow. That was filmed on that. So you don't need the best cameras, you don't need the best thing, you just need a really good, for narrative, you need a really, really good story. And that's what it comes down to. Wow. Uh, next to hearing that someone has money left over from financing their film, hearing that a short film made a profit is the most astounding thing I've heard today. <laughs> uh, it's, it's made its budget back and then some. And, we, and I own all the rights, uh, I just haven't put it up on like Amazon yet. But uh, we have a, 
it got distribution. Um, it was on there for three years, and then we got we got the rights back um, after the three years. And so it was nice to get those get those checks. Wow, what's the film called? It's called The Wolf of Wabamick Woods, and it is based on the missing and murdered Indigenous women of Canada. Yep. Um, I have a book coming out called The Wild Boy of Wabamick. How do you know Wabamick? Wabamick is uh, where my cottage is, actually. And do you know what Wabamick means? I've heard what Wabamick means. I was means. born in Wabamick. Were you? Yes. Go ahead. Tell in us what it means. McDougal? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I heard that Wabamick means white beaver. Yes. <laughs> That's what it means. Where is that exactly? Uh, just out of Perry Sound. Yeah. I think it's south of Perry Sound, north of Perry Sound. Yeah. I was little when I left. I yeah. didn't a, have a compass. Little, little town. You drive to the, uh, there's not even a stoplight. Can I ask a question? Uh, was it a genre film? Was it like a thriller? Was it gory? It was a thriller. I wouldn't say it was gory. No, there wasn't. There wasn't gore, but it was. It was a thriller. It would, yeah, it'd be a, a thriller. So, a dramatic I thriller. think this is a really good point to make to all the filmmakers listening. If you want to turn a profit on mm -hmm. something, you should make a thriller. And there should be, it's much easier to make money on a horror or a thriller than it is on just a small character piece. So yes. he was very, Absolutely. very smart to yep. make his film that way. I have never done that. <laughs> your, your film is a thriller. Was Twins not? Mm. No. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 I, it's not, yeah, I, yeah, if you, if you want to turn a profit, it should be a genre, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's actually, yeah, sh horror films do do well, uh, and especially coming out of Canada, too. They, they, for some reason, we do comedy and horror very well. I don't know why. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about, uh, um, we talked about uh, money, prop financing, um, and Katie, you actually brought us nicely to this. Um, what makes a great short film? What is the kind of story you should be looking for? Um, Katie sort of opened that up with, the, with probably the right answer, but I mean, maybe there is no right answer. What's your thoughts on this, Kyle? So what makes a good short story, basically, short film? Sure, yeah, something we'd want to watch, something that you, uh, like, doesn't need to be artistic, doesn't need to be, like, Michael Snow made a, a career out of things that are just images. Um, and yet we, we, we have Steve who made a, a thriller and a prophet, for s <laughs> which I'm going to do as soon as I leave. Um, I think that because we're talking about short films, right, which is generally like 20 minutes or less all the way down to like one minute long, mm -hmm. that it's hard to always stick to the established like story structures that we like in Western Western storytelling, right? So what I think really um, comes out of them or, or what makes them successful is if they can move people. If there's some emotional response that you are trying to attempt to elicit in the audience, that feels successful. Because sometimes the story doesn't have enough time to go from you know, the whole adventure. Um, but whether you're feeling scared or feeling love, or feeling, you know, doubt, whatever, whatever it might be. I think that that's, that's the area where short films can, can really play, because it doesn't take very long to move somebody. You know, I'm stealing a line from Glenn Gould, who was the moderator prior to me. If you find him very soothing and comforting, it's because he is also a psychotherapist. <laughs> And as Glenn Gould said, I'm feeling so much better right now. It's his line, but it works. <laughs> Paula, finding a good story. Yeah, I think moving is something I was going to say as well, and I so agree. Like, I think good writing is good writing is good writing. And, um, you know, I'm th the short that I just directed was given to me by my dear friend, Deb McGrath, who's an incredible writer, incredible comedian. And I just feel like there was no beat wasted. She was so thoughtful about every single moment in the script, every bit of dialogue. And everybody we shared the script with was moved from, from the read. And I think that, that was a really good indicator to me that it was working. 
Um, and, and also, I just have to go with what my taste is. So I don't know if it's smart. You know, I'm not necessarily thinking about commercial viability, but I'm interested in families. It's a story about a grandparent and a granddaughter, which is one of the greatest joys of my life, is my relationship with my grandparents. So it felt like so, so serendipitous to be handed this script. And it felt like a very easy yes. So I hoped that because it meant so much to Deb and her family and me, that it might affect other people too. Um, you know, the, the, the discussion, I keep reflecting back to another uh, a panel, but it was about uh, uh, voice and representation. Uh, watching your film, there is uh, uh, transgender uh, themes in it and mm -hmm. transgender characters. Um, were you concerned at all in making this short ab about voice, about representation? Uh, not concerned, really uh, touched that Deb and her real life daughter, Kinley, who is a trans actress who stars in the film with Deb, um, would trust me with it. So I took it on as a huge responsibility. It's their um, father and grandfather's real life story and experience with Louis body dementia. And it's about his experience with the imaginary giant that comforted him, comforted him in the final stages of that disease. So there was a lot to kind of um, you know, ensure that we handled correctly, but they are such a generous family. Uh, Colin uh, Mockery, who was our EP and married to Deb, and, and Kinley, like, I just learned so much from them, and they, uh, you know, I felt very, very lucky that they would trust me with this. So I think it's just about making sure that you're always communicating, making sure that everyone feels comfortable on set, making sure that all those, those, um, plot points are handled with sensitivity, and uh, you know, that's, I just tried to, to keep on that path. It, it is a very well-focused film, uh, and, and one of the things I saw, I, don't, I think everyone on this panel is too young, and there's a few people in the audience who aren't, uh, to remember Harvey, the James Stewart movie, where he has a giant rabbit that's his friend. It was always oh yeah, I love, I love oh. that movie, yeah. Yeah, and when I was watching that film, I went, oh my God, James Stewart had dementia in this film. And we all thought this was this beautiful fantasy film. And so you, you helped reframe a classic movie. Oh, I'm thrilled. <laughs> Katie, uh, now I forgot what the, my question was, but I'm sure you remember. I think the initial question was, what makes a good short film? Um, I don't think that there's one right answer to that, actually. Uh, I think that a lot of why I make the things I do is a, from a feeling of why hasn't this been made yet? or why hasn't this story been told yet, or um, why doesn't this particular lens on this particular feeling exist in the world? Um, I would tell any emerging filmmakers to try to, to when you're starting, um, write what you know, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be autobiographical. You can write, we all have, you know, there's no human feeling that's alien to me, right? So if you want to write about a certain feeling but through a different lens than what you're exactly experiencing, I think that, that's, that you can do that too. Um, but I would say, you know, for me, my work comes from a like, oh, why am I not watching this show yet? Or movie, or, yeah. You know, you're always one step ahead of me, Katie. I was going to say, <laughs> I wonder if write what you know could be translated into write what you feel. Yes, I mean, I, I hope so. I think there's a lot of discussion happening in society now about representation and who's allowed to tell what stories. And I think that all those conversations are really important. But it would make me sad if we could only ever write our lived experiences. Yes. So I think you can write what you feel. I'm not an authority on that, though, so don't call me. No, yeah. no, and, and it is a bigger, and I, I was thinking maybe we're, we're going into an area that this panel's not about, but in fact, even in short films, we have to be concerned about representation. We have to be concerned about uh, uh, other elements that, that come in. Um, you have a film, uh, am I wrong, or right, right, about Tom Thompson? So, yes, yeah, so then, uh, right, well, Tom Thompson, of course, is not BIPOC in any way, but, but he, uh, you know, his paintings sort of represent uh, a, a spirit that seemed otherly, that seemed more indigenous than, in fact, by, uh, than in fact who he is. Um, so was that ever a concern with, with you, uh, representation, and you're dealing with a real person in this case? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I uh, consulted with... Um, uh, historians on it uh, with First Nation. There is um, there is land recognitions within within the film. Um, the music uh, speaks to uh, connect connecting to the land, like flutes and that type of thing. So th I, I don't think you could tell Tom's story without in, in, um, including that element to it. Um, it's just he's connecting to the land, and that that kind of music just connects me to it. 
Um, so it was it was a, a, th a thought uh, to it. I like I said, I, I did have consultation on it. Um, and I think it's really important going th going forward, and if you're making any any film, to look at what the subject is and say, do I need to talk to somebody about this? And, and just to check those, make make sure you're in in line with it. Um, and uh, it's Tom Thompson. We all know that Tom Thompson, you know, disappeared. Uh, so uh, have you made another thriller? <laughs> Uh, I actually have a feature that is based on, on Tom. I wouldn't say this is a proof of concept, but I guess it could be a proof of concept, because this is a very light film. Even though the story about Tom is a little bit darker, the feature would be a lot darker than, than what, what this is. So it's not really that, but um, what was the question? <laughs> well, you know, I, well, my real question is, do you, do you solve the mystery of Tom Thompson? Uh, in researching this, I found so many um, uh, Places where I'm like, oh, that could happen to him. That could happen to him. Uh, so I do and I don't. I, I leave it up for the audience to decide. But um, it's it's still a mystery of what happened. Yeah. How an experienced canoeist, uh, an outdoorsman, you know, fell and drowned in 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 his in the lake that right, right near where he was staying. That's a mystery. How did that happen? How does that happen? Well, I, I look forward to the film yeah. to answer that. Um, what are the expectations then? Once once the film's complete, uh, we you know we are all, aren't all as fortunate as as Steve to, to to make a profit from these films. So what are the expectations of your films? Can, well, I can just you get started at that end? Well, yeah. I, I've made uh, other films that have not done anything. So <laughs> don't take like not it, not even it's into not my like hometown day. festival. You didn't even get in. I was like seriously. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, so it, <laughs> you take it with a great salt. Like you have yeah. your ups and you also have your downs. Yeah. So um, yes. Oh, so question again. <laughs> we were talking about your ups. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, what what the expectations that when you make a film? I think the expectation is just you, you know you wanna you wanna share it with people. You want people to respond to it to like it. Um, it's great if it screens in a festival. I think at the end of the day, you just have to be happy with the product, and and if it makes people laugh, great. If it's only online, great. Um, know what you want out of it, and if you can uh, get that, great. And if you get uh, into a festival, if you get people that like it, if people want to buy it, that's just that's just like the cherry on top. Wh who buys them? Um, well, this one was through um, a Comcast uh, Xfinity Stream Picks got ours. Uh, now I don't know who would do it because that was that was several years ago, but. Um, there's, there's many options right now to, to make money on. If you, so there's a lot of short film distributors that mm. you could just Google and find, and you can send them your film. Another way to get your film noticed is to submit it to places like Short of the Week or mm. get try to get a Vimeo staff pick. Then often people will come to you and say, um, oh, we're interested in distributing your film or we want to put it up on our platform. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to distribute a short film. Sometimes you will make money, sometimes you won't, but it, you will often get it seen by more people. CBC um, Gem. Uh, it was the Face Off, the short yeah. film Face Off. Um, that's oh it. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's one too. So you know, it screens on on broadcast, and then you have it online. I know somebody that just had a film in that, and yeah. so it's it's definitely a, a, a platform that people should explore. Paula. Yeah, and I'm also thinking of Crave and on router opportunities now. You know, I I think it's case by case. Like I think. Um, but in, in my specific case, I think for for Deb, it was really, we just want people to really see this story. It, it sh, you know, she um, is so close to it. So getting it out to festivals, even getting to see it with an audience yesterday was so special. And I'm sorry Deb wasn't here for that. But we are starting, we're starting to do our festival run and that's really thrilling and, um, and, and would love to eventually put it up online. Like I think this really was about telling this specific story. Um, and then for, for me personally wanting to like, cut my teeth as director and getting to do that with a crew that I, a lot of the crew which actually we worked with on Katie's film, we're all in this together, um, and that I've worked with on Slasher here as an actor, came out to do this for me. So I'm, I'm always very um, moved by, you know, colleagues of ours who are more experienced than I am in, in these areas coming out to, to do something um, that's so literally short. So I'd love to keep working with those people and now I feel that bolstered by the community and feel like maybe I could, you know, move into hopefully longer form stuff, so. Yeah, and not to speak for Paula and I, but we made short films because we wanted to be directors. And when you're yeah. an actor, yeah. someone picks you 
always. You can't just act. And that's very frustrating, I think, especially for yeah. people who have personalities like Paula and I. <laughs> we're doers. <laughs> we're, we're doers. We're busy. But no, I made a short film because I wanted to be, become a director. So that was really my only goal. Yeah. Well, that, that's mm -hmm. great. I mean, right, right from the beginning to the top of our question, Ben, definitely the calling card aspect or uh, a proof of concept um, is legitimate. It's completely mm -hmm. legitimate. I think uh, as, as an actor, I've always wanted to be like, wow, I'm not, I'm not being seen as that. Okay, I want to, I want to do a short that, that shows me in a different light mm -hmm. that people wouldn't normally, and like, oh, okay, good. I've seen a short in a uh, festival. Um, uh, a guy was in it, and the next film I saw him in was X Men. So I was like, I don't know if it was a direct correlation, but <laughs> shorts play before features at festivals. People see those. You know, you can, it can really put you out there. So as an actor, that's kind of my take. I wasn't looking at directing. I was always looking at uh, an acting side to it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so, uh, in a way, I guess, calling card, if you want to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyle, uh, jump in on this. What was the original question? Yeah, I hate when you ask me that, because <laughs> <laughs> you're, what's the, you're supposed what's to the, be listening. What's the purpose of a yeah. sh making a short film? Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Everything that's already been explained, these are, these are definitely purposes of short films. The stuff that I've made to this point has, has largely been uh, in some grassroots community initiative where the focus is completely not on does it return a profit, it's completely not on where does it get streamed, it's completely on do these people that I'm making it with feel like this is a, is a nice contribution to their community or representation of themselves, right? So I think about one initiative that we had in Toronto with in, within a, a newcomer community called St. Jamestown, mm -hmm. where it was a group of youth that had just started to reflect on the fact that all of the content they see that's geared towards their age group was not about them. They're Tamil, they're from Burundi, they're from all, all sorts of places. Um, and they feel like, you know, 13 reasons why it doesn't represent mm -hmm. <laughs> their life in any way, right? So we, we made our own web series. And then we went around, we partnered with the Toronto District School Board, eventually, and went to different public schools and would screen these short films about kids that look exactly like the ones that are in the audience. And then we would have creative workshops afterwards and discussions about how does this translate into into what you're experiencing in your life. So I mean, that's definitely one thing, right? Um, even this short film that's in this festival now, I think the extent of our hopes for it was let's get into certain festivals. We specifically wanted to get into this one because we have friends here. <laughs> and that was really nice. We specifically wanted to get into Vox Popular Media Arts Festival because that's in Thunder Bay where we shot the film. And that was the first festival it was in. It felt really good that the people who were involved could come out to that festival. And we got into Imaginative, which is coming up, which is a highlight festival if it has anything to do with indigenous content or indigenous creators, right? So, I mean, that's the extent. And then, like somebody else, I think you said, you know, the rest is gravy. If it does get picked up somewhere, that's awesome. That wasn't the particular goal for this, right? We were exploring an approach to working with certain people in a certain way. Yeah, what I find fascinating is of the, the four panelists that each of them have very specific reasons uh, to make short films, each legitimate, each completely legitimate uh, on, a, on, a, on a scale. I think we've got the entire rainbow there, scale and rainbow, mixed metaphor, but anyway. <laughs> Um, I'm going to uh, ask people if they have questions to line up at the mic because I do want to make sure that we have time for that. Uh, but before uh, we go directly to this, I do want to ask about uh, performances uh, mm. because uh, uh, certainly uh, in your case, Eric Peterson was in your film. Uh, in your case, Katie Boland was in your film. And so forth. So. Uh, the importance of, uh, and, and the fact of getting these people. Really, I'm going to actually condense that question to, is it all right to break the actor code? I did that with my film, and it didn't, it, you know, it wasn't well received. The film still got out, and it was well received. But breaking the actor code was essential 
for me to make the film. Explain to us what that means. Um, hiring a non-actra performers. Oh, that we cannot do. No, no we cannot. Yeah, so that, that has in changed then. In, in your our, case. In our case, in the amazing work that you're doing, you're working with real people, so that's different. But as we are union members, mm -hmm. so we have to work within union rules, which can be, it's amazing, and it can be frustrating. It can make things harder. And I mean, I'm just spitballing. It's not to say that I think if there was somebody we loved that wasn't an actor member, you know, I'd hope that the union would be in our corner if we wanted to expedite. Yeah, they, they uh, would you know, that's them. they would yeah. permit them. Yeah, so, it's, so there is conversations, yeah. but we would we would it would still be an actor production, I guess. Is this the, lines up with my question. Actually. Perfect, good. Good. perfect, good. Because uh, I have produced and directed two short films, but I'm an actor member, right, and can't uh, be in my own short. If that makes sense. Yeah. I use non-union. So how do you go about? Because Katie, you mentioned that you start in your own. Short. So, how do you go about uh, producing a short if you're an actor member and want to be in your own film? Does that make sense? Yeah. As a question. Um, so, I all of my productions were actra because I had a little money to make them, so I couldn't. I had to pay people. Right. Um, in making my film, it was an interesting experience. I remember I had to write a nudity writer for myself. Actor made me do that. And I was like, but it's me. I'm the director. And they were like, we don't care. You have to still do it. Um, so I think it's a budget. I think it's budget dependent uh, what actor will let you get away with. But I think if you are a member, you can get into sort of a tricky situation if you're doing a non union shoot. Right. So I would presume then you'd have to contact Actra if you have an idea and you want. Yes, you always you contact Actra, you send them the script, and everyone here can speak to this too. Not yeah. You can get uh, permits, right? You can get a yeah. So the permits, and I think Actra is really pushing for um, uh, non-union to become union. Right? Yeah. So if you, if you're working with a non-union talent member, you can get a permit. Um, but yes, you have to approach Actra, say I'm making this film. Here's the budget. Here's my script, and then they will. Uh, be like, here are the different tiers that you can pay people at, essentially. But they're there to help you, and they are okay. your union. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Good luck with I it. I just want to say, can people get their actor card by, by performing in shorts? I don't know what the rules are. I don't know what the qualifications are. Sure. I, I, don't, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think you need to be permitted a few times before you can become right. a full member. Yeah. When I was starting out, when I was a young buck, um, <laughs> many moons ago. Um, I, it was like through the f Sheridan College I got, I didn't get paid but I got a credit. So that was oh, like, and so, so through film schools you got a credit um, to for, yeah. toward your actor. So there was that, I don't know if that's still around but that's. Yeah. Yeah. It, would, it would make sense that uh, 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 film schools would, would be able to sort of skirt around that issue. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm a fan of unions. I think they're necessary and essential, but I, I, I do know that, uh, that sometimes there could be roadblocks, and I know a lot of actors that have. I think that's the direction with the uh, film schools, because I have worked in shorts, yeah. and you're okay with just the film school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, there's like a, an umbrella agreement. Yeah, your question. Good. Yeah. Katie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to wait Excuse me, your question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, so. Uh, so I'm kind of just starting out, like uh, about a year out of out of school. I just had a question, really, because of the panel. So I'm having trouble, like, uh, selecting like a, an idea to like start out as a short film. So like, I get to the process, I like I select one, I flesh it out a little bit, but then I get to like doubting, like, is this good enough? Like, yeah. is this really should it, I let this be my first one? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just I had a question, like, how do you select? How did you select your first idea? Like, what would your process? Be? Like, I just in general for selecting ideas. That's a great question. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Well, the doubt never goes away. Mm -hmm. You'll never, I still doubt, like, why did I make my feature? Was that a good idea? So that feeling will never go away. You just make peace with it, I think. Mm -hmm. But my advice to you for your first short is I would write something that's shootable. So whether that means it's few locations, few characters, something contained, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to maybe like a big sci-fi epic because those are harder to actually make. Special effects. Special yeah. effects, and um, I would also see if you have a, like a community of a few trusted friends and that you think are good writers or who are smart people and get them to read stuff and give you feedback. You don't have to exist alone in a vacuum. It can be very lonely and you can just die under all that doubt. Um, 
the doubt doesn't go away, though. You will learn to live with it. I just, I just want to add, you know, I think uh, specificity is so universal. So I wouldn't worry in terms of the story. This is just my own my own take. I wouldn't worry about what is everybody going to love, because not everybody needs to love everything. But something that means a lot to you will find a very specific audience. So like, continue to be in tune with that. Continue to think about like, what movies move me, and why do they move me, and why do I think about them for years after? And it can be something really small in a moment that was really important to you, or just just go with that and be, and you know, go with your gut, as lame as that sounds, maybe. Can I just pick up right where you left off? Yes, please. Something that comes to mind is something that I read uh, a long time ago, Ernest Hemingway. Mm -hmm. When he's having trouble with his writing, he wrote, I just pick one true sentence. Mm -hmm. I, write, I write the truest sentence I know and continue from that point on. Because even Hemingway had doubt, mm -hmm. right? Beyond that, I think also as somebody who's in control of the story that you're telling, you're thinking about what to tell, you're going to be thinking about how to make it, and then you make it, you can decide who sees it too. It doesn't have to get made and then, and then be broadcast to everybody and have all these other opinions about it come back. Mm -hmm. You can make something and, and, and put it away. Nobody has to see it, right? There's no rule about that. Whatever you're passionate about, because you're going to be with the film for a while. So find that passion mm -hmm. that's going to sustain you throughout it. You're so welcome. Good luck with it. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if, uh, if we can bring up the idea of authenticity again on, on a different scale. Just about the, the Because you said something wonderful. You talked about how authentic are we are with ourselves uh, sometimes. And if, if I wonder about that authenticity, even if you have doubts. If doubt cannot add a level of, um, f for lack of a better word, something endearing about your film wor work. Like if you, that the doubt can actually work for you. Any ideas on that? I think for sure. If your story will not land as well if you have doubt about it and you, pr you try to pretend that the doubt isn't there. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't translate into authenticity, right? Uh, people will see that. They'll be like, oh, this is the story of someone who doesn't, isn't telling it from their perspective, right? Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, but that, that, was, that was great. I, anybody else have thoughts on that? So Steve? Uh, doubt, I think, would fear would be doubt. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, fear is the path that holds the most rewards. So if, if you're afraid, that's a good thing. Um, you know, if I'm afraid today about screening this film, and I think that's good. <laughs> Um, for many reasons, but um, you know, I think that uh, if you're not afraid, then then there's not a lot in it, and you're not going to have that uh, investment from yourself into it because you're. Uh, no, it's fine. It'll be good. You know, right. why why do you care then? Why because also, what does fear tell you? Fear tells you that this is important to you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Fear is like humanity's number one motivator for survival. Right, so when you are afraid of something, it's because it's important to you, and I don't know. You you kind of you can respect that, and you say, okay, this is important. I'm afraid, but it's more important than I am afraid. So enlightening. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very calm. We're we're all leaving these, this room of better people. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if yeah. we can make a short film, but we're going to really feel good about ourselves. <laughs> Katie, do you have anything to add to this? Um, yeah, I think it's a fine line between you have to doubt your own work. You have to, you can't just think that your first draft is amazing, you know. But there's a fine line between also letting the doubt and your own self confidence issues just ruin everything. Uh, that's been a struggle that I've had through a lot of my life. So I have a very tight group of friends in my community. Paula would be one of them who I would send my first drafts to. And I'm doubtful enough about them that I'll absolutely take notes. Um, but I don't let my, like, any feelings of low self-worth, et cetera, stop me from doing something that I set out to do. Wow. Uh, it, it is very comforting to know that the people on this panel all have felt doubt, all have felt fear. And I, and I bet you if we talked to uh, another echelon of filmmakers, they would tell you the same thing. So I, th I think you're probably on the right path. You are. Yeah. 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 Sir. Katie was supposed to ask what you wanted. She didn't. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. No. Uh, first of all, my name is Frank. I'm from Sudbury. 
I'm Nick Frank. I'm a geologist and I'm prospector, but I'm also a wannabe filmmaker. And I've shot about, over the past 15, 20 years, I've shot about 15, 20 short little films, uh, two of which ones, the Community Pulse Award at Cinefesta 15 years ago. So, I, you know, I, like you guys, I made it for a few hundred dollars in my own pocket or a box of donuts and some pizza type thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I really enjoy the panel, the, the variety of the panel and the depth of the things. I enjoy the Hemingway quote, the psychoanalysis, yes. and you guys are very open and up, up front, so I appreciate it. But my question is, with some of my shorts that I've done in the past or half a dozen I'd like to do in the future, is, what's the best way to maybe try and get some uh, exposure distribution? Should I, can I re-enter some of my old ones into a, uh, another uh, film festival or get an, a YouTube channel or some of the other uh, suggestions you, you people mentioned uh, previously? What would be the best way to do get more exposure for that? Because I've got a, a script I've written and uh, upload a third draft for a, a longer script and some shorter things I want to do go beyond and use this as a springboard to move forward. But it's hard to do it on my own. Uh, films are collaboration, of course. And uh, that's my question. I think um, for certain festivals, a lot of festivals, you'll have to have, uh, it has to be completed after a certain date. So uh, the older older films I don't think would be able to be submitted. Um, but you can definitely put them online to, to showcase what you can do. And then that, that would be my, my thought. Yeah, I would submit. Well, you can always lie to a film festival. That's Sorry, you, you, just <laughs> you can always lie. Just don't kidding. Don't lie. No, just kidding. But um, you can always say. Isn't that lying you against it. ACTRA rules? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can always say you made it within the last calendar year. Um, although that's a little bit dicey and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but I would recommend submit it to Amleto. That's a YouTube, I'll write it down for you after. It's a YouTube channel that screens a bunch of shorts. I would do short of the week. I would do Vimeo staff pick. I would Google YouTube short film channels and submit it because those submissions are normally much cheaper than a film festival and they do have a very wide audience. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Great suggestion. Well, one quick question is also, yeah. you talked about funding uh, that doesn't no longer exist, the Greenberg Fund and the, the Bravo one for develop, script development. Um, do you have to have, would my pre-existing shorts be proof of, of um, Proof of, of concept for a feature? Proof of concept for, yes. for future funding for other sources? Y yes, especially if they are aligned with what you're making your feature film about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, sir. You uh, have content that exists. Presumably there's, there's a, platform out there somewhere in the world because there are thousands if not tens of thousands of, of VOD platforms that might be interested right 